time. So very good time here. So we'll, let's welcome Chantal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. Um, let me for introducing our speaker. Yeah, let me just remind you of the events in the coming days. Tomorrow we have a workshop on Bob Adaman's new book, uh, A Middle Way. The workshop starts at 9.30 with four talks, including one by Colin, I think we're going to be starting uh, tomorrow morning. We will have uh, coffee and um, uh, probably bagel tomorrow morning at nine here, in case you're coming a little bit earlier. Um, and uh, the program is online. The best of the possible worlds, you will have registered if you plan to come. I'm afraid we're not quite in that world, <laughs> but hopefully we're not too far from that world. So um, uh, if you do plan to come, please uh, go to the website, look at the program and register. That would be much appreciated. Uh, just to have a head back. On Tuesday uh, next week, we have uh, another lunchtime uh, talk given by uh, Dan Burson, who is uh, right here on uh, rich non-conceptual sensory motor representation. Uh, looking forward to that as well. And there is no uh, lunchtime talk on Friday uh, next week. A lighter, a lighter week uh, next week. Okay. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, my colleague, Mike Dietrich, from the Department of History and Philosophy of Science here at uh, as All of you uh, no, uh, Mike is a historian and philosopher of biology who works on a range of topics in this area, the history and philosophy of uh, genetics, um, the 20th century or late 19th century, 20th century, but also a range of fascinating topics such as outliers in science, uh, people who don't want to fit the mold. Um, and the controversies, he's been using also various types of methodology, while the as, you know, makes uses of usual, the usual methods in history of science. He also has done a lot of work in uh, 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 computational humanities. Uh, might not be the exact terminology, but but using computational methods to study uh, text. So um, uh, really, a lot of interesting work. He's a fellow of AAAS. He has recently edited the handbook of the historiography of biology. Uh, and half ago or two years ago, in 2023. And uh, I do not know how advanced two books are. So he is working on, or maybe has is not working on two books, one on Richard Auschwitz. Um, uh, speaking of, you know, people who don't want to pizza mold, outliers, and another one on uh, a breach of survival of the Lucius. Uh, how far are they from? Uh, survival of the luckiest goes in in March. Yeah, very close very to good. very close to me. Looking looking forward. My floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Thank you all for coming out um, today. I want to talk about um, this fellow here. This is Richard Lewinton. Um, he was one of the the premier evolutionary geneticists of the 20th century. And today, what I want to do is tell you about some work that I've been doing with uh, Ehud Lam and Oren Harman. Um, on Lewontin in particular on his research on linkage. And the, the sort of puzzle here is that in the 1970s, when Lewontin uh, was sort of at his most active, he proposed that the entire genome should congeal or crystallize into a single chromosome or supergene. And he was serious about that. Now, he knew that this had not happened, Right, but yet he proposes this thing, uh, and so what was he thinking, <laughs> right, with this idea? And it wasn't like a one-off, like in a footnote. It was like a major part of his research program. So this is sort of the initial puzzle: how to make sense out of uh, linkage in the context of evolutionary genetics in the late 20th century by one of the leaders in the field. The the very specific. Uh, context is this book, The Evolutionary Basis or The Genetic Basis of Evolutionary Change, 1974. This was a landmark book um, for Lewinton. Um, it set uh, an agenda that really brought evolutionary biology into molecular focus, 
It reshapes the problems of the field. It also is the book that most philosophers of biology uh, in the first generation cut their teeth on um, because most of them were actually in Lewinton's lab starting actually from this time period. Now, the thing that I wanna focus your attention on is this last, this quotation here. This is actually how the book ends um, with this phrase that he says, the fitness of a single locus, in other words, a single gene that's ripped from its interactive context is about as relevant to real problems of evolutionary genetics as the study of the psychology of individuals isolated from their social context is to the understanding of man's socio-political evolution, okay? So in other words, he thinks it's ridiculous. We have to recontextualize the gene. Um, and so, and we'll, we'll come back to the whole social political metaphor um, in, at the end, okay? So let me tell you a little bit about Lewinton to try to sort of motivate this problem and explain um, his approach to this, this issue. Oops, too many. So um, Lewinton uh, is a child of New York City. Um, he ends up going to uh, Harvard University and then Columbia for his PhD. Um, and then through a series of appointments, his first one's at North Carolina State until he eventually gets called back to Harvard University. Um, it would not be sort of a mistake to think of him as kind of a, a boy genius. He certainly was uh, very young and very talented. This is a picture of him uh, when he won the Westinghouse Science Competition um, as a teenager. So he's very much predisposed to science when he goes to Harvard. Harvard at that time was a little unusual. They didn't really have a geneticist on staff. Um, and so a uh, visitor, Mel C. Dunn, is the person that teaches him genetics. Dunn is on loan from Columbia. And so Dunn pulls him back to Columbia where Lewinton is going to work with really the foremost evolutionary biologist of the 20th century, this person right here in the middle, Theodosius Dobzhansky. Dobzhansky is the person that sort of brings together evolution and genetics into uh, an experimental, naturally based research program. Um, these are all of, or not, this isn't even all, this is most of uh, Dobzhansky's students at the time. Lewinton's down here. Um, we don't need to go through and name all the names. The thing that Dobzhansky is doing, though, at this time, sort of the post-war period, is he's figured out how to study natural populations of the fruit fly Drosophila. Fruit fly Drosophila is sort of the premier genetic organism. And in particular, what he's doing is he's, a, he's using this discovery from 1932 that the salivary chromosomes in Drosophila have this very distinctive banding pattern. And that banding pattern is stable. In other words, it's a marker that is physically constant. And so if there's a genetic change, you can actually see it in the banding pattern, okay? But even better, if there's an inversion, if part of the chromosome flips around, it creates these characteristic loops. And Dobzhansky discovers as he's sort of riding his horse through the mountains of California collecting fruit flies, that different regions have flies with different characteristic inversion loops. And so now, instead of actually having to do hard work of breeding flies, characterizing them genetically, he can collect them, look at the inversion patterns and have a genetic marker, right? That's very easy to detect and very easy to characterize these natural populations with. This sets off a huge research program that Dobzhansky sort of calls the genetics of natural populations. And all of his students are sort of very much sort of pulled in to this tradition of research. Now, I realized that most of you didn't spend the morning like catching up on classical genetics. So I'm gonna catch you up with everything you need to know in about four minutes, okay? So what are these guys talking about? They are pulling on a tradition that's really started by Thomas Hunt Morgan, who's the first person to do research on Drosophila genetics. Genetics is done through a series of crosses. So you're mating different types of flies and looking at the ratios and appearance of different bodily forms, okay? Thomas Hunt Morgan um, develops this research organism and develops what's called the chromosomal theory of inheritance. The idea being that the genes that are responsible for these individual traits are located on chromosomes. And so by tracking different, in this case, I mutants, right? You can sort of identify what the differences are from the wild type or the naturally occurring type. And then you can sort of start to do various things with those. Now, part of the chromosomal theory is that there are these larger bodies in your cell nucleus, right, the chromosomes, 
the chromosomes themselves are hypothesized to be a linear string of genes, right? So genes are like uh, a pearl necklace or beads on a string, okay? Um, but occasionally, these beads of strings, strings of beads, can exchange halves, right? So there can be recombination. So this is called crossing over through a chiasma type or a junction, and you can get recombinations to produce different combinations of genes on the same chromosome. OK, that recombination allows different chromosomes to sort of have different uh, literal different chemical constituents. OK, Morgan is doing this at Columbia in Shemmerhorn Hall. And naturally, what he does is all good researchers is he recruits a large body of undergraduates to do the hard labor for him. Oh. And these are his two prize students. This is uh, Calvin Bridges and Alfred Sturdivant. And these two together start out as undergraduates and we'll get their PhD with Morgan and we'll go on to sort of uh, have professorships at Caltech. So Bridges is exceptionally good at spotting the mutations, right? These fruit flies are tiny, but he's incredibly good at spotting and tracking them. One of the things that he does, it's not pictured in here, is he creates what's called the totem pole. The totem pole is a four-sided thing. And every time there's a mutation, they have to figure out where it's going to go on the totem pole. So they spot a new mutation, like red eyes become sort of pinkish. He puts that up on the totem pole. What they start to notice is that there's association groups. Genes seem to sort of cluster with other kinds of genes, and they don't typically go from one side of the totem pole to the other. That's very handy because Drosophila has four chromosomes. There's four sides to the totem pole. And so they can say each of these association groups must represent the constituents of a physical chromosome. Sturdivant then does something super clever. They say, what's the simplest way to think about the organization of genes on one of these bodies? Well, the simplest way would be just to sort of line them up in linear order. That would be good, okay? But how do you know like, what the order is, how far apart they are, where they are in relationship to each other? To do that, you do what's called recombination mapping, what they invent as recombination mapping. And so at the top, this is a set of genes sort of marked that on two chromosomes that are side by side. Um, the little y um, is the recessive form. The big Y is the dominant form. Um, and so this is you know, all of these different mutations, yellow, white, all the way down to bar I. And then what Sturdivant does is through a series of matings, he counts how many times you get crossing over events. How many times does this order that he's constructed get scrambled up? Right, either in single crossover events or in double crossover events. And how often a recombination occurs becomes associated with distance. The farther you are on part on the chromosome, the more likely a junction is going to occur. So between bar and yellow, there's a lot of chromosome. So there's lots of room for recombination. So the probability of recombination is much, much higher. So you can use the probability of recombination as a representative for distance, right? And now you get linear order and relative distances on the chromosome, okay? So this is literally the first map of the chromosomes. It's Sturdivant's dissertation. Um, it'll win his advisor the Nobel Prize. So for my graduate students in the room, no pressure, <laughs> right? Um, it's an amazing uh, insight. It's really crucial to our story because linkage is the idea that some of these genes are very, very close to each other and so don't get broken up, right? In other words, they're linked together. They have some sort of tight association. It could be just based on physical proximity or there could be other forces that are keeping those genes combined together so that they don't recombine, they don't reassort, okay? From one generation to the next. All right, so that's all the background. What if, what's Dobzhansky doing? Dobzhansky's in that same research tradition. He comes from the Soviet Union, he comes into Morgan's lab. He brings with him, though, this tradition of natural history and looking at natural populations. We know that he's super interested in these inversions, where a piece of the chromosome will flip over. Inversions have a very unique property. Genes within an inversion don't tend to recombine because they, it's very hard for them to pair up with their homologous sisters. OK, so what that means is that when you see an inversion, you now have a, a place where you're going to get a block of genes that's going to stick together 
much more so than if you didn't have an inversion. So it suppresses crossing over. Sometimes they're going to call these areas super genes, right? Because they're now acting as one instead of having recombination occur, okay? The other big thing that's going on for Dobzhansky is that phenomena like this have been discovered, heterosis or heterozygote superiority. Um, the idea, and this is sort of the, the most famous case of this, which is that um, in our hemoglobin, normally, um, hemoglobin's in your red blood cells. It's essential for transportation of oxygen. When it gets down into your capillaries and you get low partial pressure, it sort of shoots off the oxygen, and that's actually crucial to your survival. In areas where falciparium malaria is endemic, though, um, you, it's, you're very susceptible if you have normal hemoglobin. It turns out, though, that if you have sickle cell hemoglobin if, <laughs> and normal hemoglobin, one copy of each gene, you're resistant to malaria. If you have two copies of the sickle cell gene, then you're susceptible to sickle cell disease. Sickle cell disease is basically when your hemoglobin dumps off the oxygen, sometimes the hemoglobin will crystallize and you'll get these nice jaggedy shaped red blood cells. The problem is your capillaries are exactly as big as a red blood cell. So these cause these crises or blood clots, um, which can be very serious. So if you're in an area where malaria is endemic, um, you don't want to have sickle cell disease. That's bad. You don't want to catch malaria. What you really want is one of each, right? So this is the heterozygous combination, right? It's one of each gene, and it's superior to either of the homozygous combinations. So Dobzhansky is obsessed with this form. He, he wants to know how often this happens because this phenomenon seems to be a, a really much better kind of combination and a way of sort of highlighting the value of variability, uh, genetic variability. And so he really becomes obsessed with what would happen if you have a whole bunch of heterozygous advantage gene combinations in a super gene. In other words, wouldn't evolution want to keep all of those really good gene combinations packaged up together? So wouldn't evolution want to select for no recombination and trying to create super genes? Dobzhansky called these co-adapted gene complexes, okay? So what he's looking for is some way to explain how these could stick in a population and retain their advantage that they confer. And his method here is that they're co-adapted within these inversions, okay? So that's all sort of the background. Lewinton goes to work as Dobzhansky's student. This is exactly the problematic that he's brought up in. Okay, but it's not exactly what he does. So one more piece of background. Hilda Geringer. Um, there had been earlier models that were sort of trying to, to uh, understand how linkage occurred, to look at how often genes get associated with each other. Uh, Geringer was an Austrian mathematician who worked with uh, von Mises, and she flees the Nazis, goes to Istanbul, and then to the United States. She's an incredibly talented mathematician. And she is one of the first people to sort of come up with a full theory of uh, linkage, right? What's the probability that these two genes are going to be able to stay together? And her really important, well, there's sort of two main things that she sort of puts out in this 1944 paper. First is that crossing over, how often and you see crossing over, isn't sufficient to actually infer linkage. So there might be something more to linkage associations than just the frequency of crossing over. So you remember Sturdivant was just using crossover frequencies and probabilities to infer things about linkage. She says that's probably not going to work in a, in a good theory, a probabilistic theory of linkage. The other thing that she shows in this paper that had a huge impact is that a little tiny bit of recombination is enough to break up linkage. It's enough to sort of wipe out the effects of linkage. That is a big result. That's one of the reasons Dobzhansky is looking for something extra that's going to keep these genes together, right? The inversion and then selection for that inversion would be enough to overcome the forces of recombination. That's because of her result in 1944. So this result is hugely influential, one, because it's the first big mathematical model, and second, because it shows a little bit of recombination goes a long way. Lewontin is skeptical, though and is going to sort of make this one of the problems of his early career. 
Now, Lewontin is, is an interesting guy in terms of his training. He's trained with Dobzhansky. He's trained as an experimental evolutionist. But while at Columbia, he also gets a master's degree in statistics. And he sort of puts himself out there as a, a new kind of theoretical biologist. In other words, another way to think about it is that he's like, like a statistical gun for hire. That's how he would put it. He sort of has these tools. He knows how to use them really well. Um, at the time, I would say there's about 10 mathematical biologists in the world. Um, there's, there's not a lot. Um, it's not common to have people that are doing this kind of mathematics in biology. So he's, he's a valuable commodity in that sense. So at North Carolina State, which is an agricultural college, he sort of hires himself out for various kinds of problems and is really good at coming up with new and interesting solutions to those. Um, just as a side note, one of the things that he does while he's at North Carolina State is he calculates the, the engineering loads on geodesic domes for Buckminster Fuller, um, the guy who invents them. So he's the one, Dick's the guy who does the math for that, right? That's it's like, he's got the tools, he'll go out and do it. And this is exactly how he's going to approach linkage. He does it through a graduate student. Kanichi Kojima comes to North Carolina State and starts to work on a PhD with Lewinton that he ends up getting in 1958. Together, what they're going to try to do is understand this problem of linkage and how to create a mathematical model for it. And so they create an equilibrium model for linkage. They want to know what's going to keep linkage in sort of an equilibrium state. And they posit this new measure called linkage disequilibrium, LD, um, that is really a measure of association between any two alleles, any two loci on a chromosome. So linkage disequilibrium does not require linkage, right? It's a mathematical model of when two alleles just happen to look like they're associated with each other. It's inspired by linkage, right? But doesn't require physical linkage. So let me tell you just a little bit about it. The model here is really simple. You have two genes with two alleles each, that gives you four possible combinations. So your genes are A and B. The two combinations are big A, little a, big B, little b. Um, and then from that, you can actually calculate D, which is your measure of linkage disequilibrium. If D is zero, then you're at equilibrium. So look at this example over here. The frequency of big A in the population is 60%. If you just have a random association of the A and B genes, right, these two loci, then you would expect to see something like these proportions, right? Um, and what you're looking at here is like in the first two, those are the big A combinations. But notice there's equal numbers of associations with big B and equal numbers of associations with little b. So that's what you would expect if there was no particular preference. Down here is a non-random association, right? So this would be linkage disequilibrium, where it looks like the big A seems to have a strong preference for the big B, right? And so that preference or non-random association is linkage disequilibrium, okay? So far so good. Now, this is a big deal, right? This is a nice mathematical result. When does it actually matter? According to Lewinton and Kojima, it matters um, when there's reduced recombination, Okay, either through linkage or through epistatic interaction, which is another kind of association between different kinds of genes. That's exactly the situation that's laid out by Dobzhansky. Co-adapted gene complexes are exactly where this should apply best. Okay, they don't say it in so many words, but I think to people at the time, it would have been super obvious that this is exactly, this model works perfectly for co-adapted gene complexes. So by 1960, the early 60s, Lewinton and other people in population genetics were very much sort of trying to develop these models of how genes associate and how they can be modeled mathematically. Um, in the 70s, starting really 1969, Lewinton starts to ask a different kind of question. He asks this question, why doesn't the genome congeal? In other words, why doesn't these sort of linkage phenomena just pull everything together? So what's changing his thinking here is that recombination is occurring. Recombination shuffles around genes, but recombination is variable. So why isn't recombination itself under selection? Like sometimes it could be good for you, sometimes it could be bad for you. Dobzhansky says there are situations where inversions keep good genes together. 
that'd be called positive epistasis. It's a good block of genes. You don't want recombination to occur to break those up. So presumably selection against recombination there would be advantageous. And so this is sort of what's motivating this idea. Like if you could sort of restrict recombination, then, and that might be a good thing to keep together positive genes that are good at, in their association with each other. Why don't you end up with one giant gene? Why doesn't the entire genome just like assemble, right, in one way? Um, so this is sort of motivated by Dobzhansky's program. It's motivated by this interest in recombination. It's also motivated by this idea that um, there must be structure within chromosomes, that chromosomes aren't just beads on a string, right? That they're not, the, the little genes aren't perfectly independent little pearls that there's more structure, there's more association. And this is sort of coming from the work of people like Cyril Darlington. It's just Lewinton's thinking about it. What if the genome has structure to it? What if recombination is being selected? Shouldn't we start to expect to see these super genes as naturally occurring? And if they're valuable, why don't they spread, okay? So another way to put that is when do recombination and super gene formation get favored by selection? Uh, the problem with this question is that it's a very difficult question to answer empirically, okay? There's not really an obvious experiment to do. So Lewinton, being a very mathematical guy, um, has a grant from the Atomic Energy Commission that he has for basically 40-ish years. And through the Atomic Energy Commission, he runs basically a giant theoretical arm of his laboratory. He's one of the first people to do computer simulations in biology. And he hires this young guy, Ian Franklin, as a postdoc. Franklin is from Australia. He comes into, and the Australian has a, Australia has a very strong tradition in mathematical population genetics. So he comes in with this very mathematical background and he sets Franklin on this problem of modeling and simulating what could happen in super gene formation. And the paper that produces this sort of first computer simulation model is called, Is the Gene the Unit of Selection? Now, if you're like a philosopher of biology, uh, the unit of selection debate is this huge debate that basically Lewinton names in 1970. He has two papers, this one and another paper on the units of selection. Philosophers of biology sort of jump into this debate with a lot of evolutionary biologists, and they focus on the other paper, not this paper. Um, to put it in sort of more contemporaneous terms, like David Hull's terms, the units of selection can be thought of as having an interactor question, the, how do organisms interact causally with their environments uh, in terms of selection? And then how, what is the stuff that's sort of heritable? What's being replicated? And what's the advantage of different kinds of replication structures? This is the replicator question. The thing the philosophers focused on was the interactor question for a long time. Uh, it's Bill Wimsatt's fault. Bill Wimsatt wrote the big paper in 1972. And there's actually a section where he says we could go this way. I'm going to go the other way, and most of the field actually responded to Wimsat for a long time, Wimsat and Lewington. Um, so this is sort of this question about the individual genes. What happens if we don't think about them as sort of the sort of atomic units of structure? Instead, think about extended blocks of linkage. And so what they develop is a, a fairly simple correlational model. And what they do is they run it through this uh, nice computer simulation to try to figure out how the genome could crystallize. And this is sort of one of the outputs uh, of their simulation. Down on the bottom, you have the loci on a chromosome. Um, this is the frequency of the alleles. Each of these lines represents the output at a certain number of generations. So 60 generations up to 200 generations. The thing to get out of this sort of messy diagram is that there's lots of things low early on and that they get pushed up and are almost straight line across the top, okay? So how do you think about this in terms of linkage? Well, if you look at uh, loci that are side by side, let's find a really dramatic one. Like this one at 25, its frequency is sort of up there about the middle. The other one is down there at almost zero right? If those were tightly linked, you would expect them to have roughly the same proportion, okay? So what they show in this diagram is that everything moves up to be in tight proportion to each other, 
they call that crystallization. And the way crystallization works is it sort of moves out from loci that are tightly associated with each other and sort of spreads through the genome, right? Through sort of neighbor contact is the model. So they think of this as um, what they call sort of extended linkage or sort of a, an embedding effect as that a linkage, the value of linkage spreads through the chromosome, okay? Um, some people call this a, a radical form of linkage, right? Because this should end up with the entire chromosome being linked together into one unit. Now the parameters, recombination is very low, right? That might be appropriate for an inversion. Selection value is very, very high, right? So these are not super realistic uh, parameters, but if those are the parameters you put into this nice correlational model, you can produce crystallization, okay? So now they have a theoretical model that shows that crystallization is possible under some circumstances, and in fact, might be expected, okay? In addition to this, Lewinton is sending out other graduate students, notably Satya Prakash, to actually measure linkage, the strength of linkage and linkage disequilibrium in different situations. And Prakash did her work studying two genes and an inversion in the third chromosome of Drosophila. And she found out that these gene contents of the inversions were strongly co-adapted. In other words, that there's strong evidence that those genes in that inversion really stick together, okay? Is it really crystallization? Well, sort of, right? But it, she only looked at two genes and one inversion on one part of this third chromosome. Other people, though, find similar kinds of results. So Kojima's group with his new graduate student, John Gillespie, finds it. Mukai's group in Japan finds it. Uh, and Brishnik's group, which is a sub- group in, within Dobzhansky's lab also finds it. So in the early 70s, you have this nice simulation and you have empirical results that are seeming to show that genes do cohere in these chromosomal inversions. Lewinton then sort of um, pushes this even further, right? And he sort of makes this big claim starting in 1970 and really culminating in 1974. Basically what he wants to say is that the right way to think about genes is that they are occurring in correlated blocks and that natural selection is operating on the correlated state. In other words, the gene is not the unit of selection. Instead, it's these correlated co-adapted gene complexes that are the things that selection is valuing. So what's required, he says, is a theory of the correlated genome. It's a theory of the genome that has structure, right? As opposed to individual genes. And even in 1974, he says it's expected that loci at opposite ends of the chromosome could be kept out of linkage disequilibrium. In other words, they could be associated with each other just by having a string of correlations connecting them, okay? Which is sort of exactly what the computer model instantiated. Um, here's the sad part of the story. It was completely wrong. Um, the <laughs> genome, this whole story was actually demolished a year before the book came out, right? This is sort of every author's worst nightmare. You work really hard on this beautiful book. It's in press. The press is getting it printed. They're getting a typeset back then. And then a year before, the Charlesworths, who are also super famous evolutionary biologists. They're really senior now. They're really young at the time, hot shots, right? Um, they show that it, it, it's just not right. <laughs> Empirically, it's not supported. They look at five genes in three different populations. They test for linkage disequilibrium and really find very little test, very little evidence for positive linkage disequilibrium. The linkage disequilibrium they do find is between genes and inversions, not between individual genes, okay? So they say there's no evidence for what they call extreme linkage disequilibrium, this idea that correlation somehow spreads and crystallizes across the genome. If there's evidence, it's for genes and inversions, okay? This follows up with a whole bunch of other studies uh, so Charles Langley teams up with uh, Kojima to show that this is not nearly, linkage disequilibrium is not nearly as intense as predicted by Franklin and Lewinton. Joe Felsenstein, who's one of Lewinton's students, says it's fascinating, but it's really irrelevant. Uh, Crow, who is actually one of the other major population geneticists, says this is going to turn out to be of little use, right? So it was good. It was interesting, but ultimately no empirical support 
And because it has no empirical support, they think no real application in natural populations. So why am I torturing you with a scientific dead end? Because dead ends matter, right? I remember the historical puzzle was, how do we explain this very, very smart guy who's spending all of his time studying linkage? So our job as historians is to contextualize. At the time Lewontin was doing this, this was good science, right? It was good science theoretically, and it was good empirically. And it makes sense if you're viewing it from this dobzhansky Lewontin paradigm or framework, par don't forget I even said that word. Um, <laughs> this framework, problematic is what Lewontin would call it, of trying to understand co-adapted gene complexes and the associations with inversions. Where it fails, right, is when he really tries to overgeneralize, right? When he moves away from inversions and says, this is a property of all genes associated along a chromosome, regardless of inversion structures that create that co-adapted um, circumstance. So this, I think, really highlights another really important move that's gonna become more pronounced even later, which is sort of a rejection of genetic individualism. The idea that the right way to think about the genome is in terms of individual genes. That is the classical model of the gene, right? That they're just beans on a string. And instead to think that we have to think about genome structure, okay? Now, if you're a, a biologist, you might have a very different reading of this because you might say, what dead end? This wasn't a dead end at all. If you're a geneticist today, you might be up to your neck doing leakage disequilibrium and selection studies. This is hugely important in contemporary genomics. This is where it started. It started with this failed research program from Lewontin. So there's different threads that go forward from this, okay? One of the most important is the fact that this guy, John Maynard Smith, was working with Lewontin. Lewontin wrote this book at the University of Sussex in Maynard Smith's laboratory. So as he was sort of with Maynard Smith, um, Lewontin impresses upon Maynard Smith that Maynard Smith needs to write this other paper on linkage. In particular, pushes Maynard Smith to articulate what's called the hitchhiking effect. The idea that you could have one really strongly selected gene that's gonna pull along all the other genes that are next to it. So if you have one gene that's really, really strongly selected and it's physically linked to its surrounding genes, those ones that are like, eh, selection doesn't really care about them, maybe cares about them a little, right? Or maybe selection hates them. They're gonna get pulled along higher frequencies because they're physically connected to a, that gene. Recombination can break up that association, right? So what Maynard Smith is proposing is that we look for those kinds of hitchhiking effects to look at the effect of recombination and to look at the effect of strong selection in the genome. This is an exactly another kind of implication coming out of the linkage selection research. It'll get renamed in 1991 by Andrew Berry, another Lewontin student, um, in terms of selective sweeps. Right now, um, Oren and Ehud and I are working on exactly this transition, and I'll sort of give it away. It's, it's not out in print yet. Selective sweeps become associated with genomic data very strongly, not 100%. But typically, this term is used to look at nucleotide patterns. Hitchhiking still is used to talk about genes or other larger genetic units in association with each other. That terminological difference reflects a really, really important difference just conceptually about what's going on. So people still, I think, like this idea that genes can be independent from each other. They don't really boil that down when you get down to the nucleotide level. The idea that the unit correct unit of heredity is the single nucleotide doesn't have a lot of traction, right? We think that nucleotides necessarily are bonded to other things, into codons, and then into bigger units within a gene. So selective sweeps has a very different status than hitchhiking at higher levels within the genome. So not only do you have more genome structure, right? But the phenomenon here is fundamentally different in terms of the expectations of interrelations with other parts of the genome. So we're working out that story. That'll be coming out soon. But I want to give you a third way, a third kind of context here. Um, so remember this quotation from the beginning, right? That basically says uh, individualism in the genome is stupid. It's as stupid as being an individualist about human society. 
The other thing, one of the other things that Lewington is super famous for is for his Marxist biology. And so with Dick Levins, he writes this book, The Dialectical Biologist, which is really a collection of essays in 1985. So the third context for understanding what's going on with linkage is deeply political. So the 1974 book is a very, very political book, right? Even though it's filled with really boring math and stuff about linkage, it's a radical politics manifesto from Lewinton. So let me show you how. Um, in order to understand this, you have to understand that uh, what's going on with Lewinton. So 1968, he's living in Chicago. He's a professor at the University of Chicago, and in fact, is a dean at the University of Chicago. Lewinton and his partner, Mary Jane, had been brought up in a very sort of left politically active uh, environment in New York City. Lewinton uh, eschews politics because they have kids early on and he wants to be a stable bread earner and, and all that kind of stuff. But the kids are growing up, late 60s, it's kind of unavoidable. Mary Jane becomes very in involved in the, the student protest movement in Chicago. Remember 1968, there's nice riots around the Democratic National Convention. They're deeply involved in politics at this point. The thing that really radicalizes Lewinton is the 1969 murder of Black Panther Fred Hampton. So the police, Fred Hampton is an incredibly charismatic, multiracial coalition builder at Chicago. The police and the FBI want him gone, and they, they literally shoot him uh, in his bed. Lewinton and other people on the left are actually brought in before dawn to actually see the crime scene. So Lewinton is one of those people that came in, toured the, the, the site of the shooting, and this really pushes him to be very radical, specifically about race and the biology of human race. So from this point on, he starts to focus a lot on questions like the apportionment of human diversity, which is a very famous paper of his from 1972, this argues that race isn't biologically real, and you can imagine the conversations that we could have about that. Um, anyway, once again, applying sort of a mathematical understanding to looking at variability within and between populations to make those kinds of claims. So at this point, he's starting to think about his biology in political terms. One of the criticisms of Lewinton at this point is that his politics seems to be really separate from his evolutionary genetics. And depending on which day you talk to him about this, some days he would say, yeah, why would I mess up a good thing, right? Like, of course they're separate. Like, I want to I wanna do that. It was unnecessary, right? Um, and so he'd say things like he, he kept his politics for topics where he thought it was appropriate. At other times, though, he would say, look, I use this dialectical method to understand all of my genetics. And I think we can actually find some evidence of that dialectical approach in his research on linkage. So within his lab, this was actually one of the, the little posters that was posted, right? It's a quotation from a, a newspaper. Uh, Lewinton observes the Marxist professor, which would be Lewinton, must create in his workplace a situation that intensifies contradiction, that intensifies the class struggle, and then engages in revolutionizing practice in the day-to-day -day, uh, relations on the job. And if you want, I could talk about how he physically organized his lab to sort of instantiate this when he moved to Harvard. Just like he's sort of an anti-individualist for people, I think that same attitude is carrying over to genes. It's related to anti-reductionist critiques that will come out against genetic determinism. It's sort of interested in this engaging of opposing factors within the genome. So linkage versus recombination can be understood as a dialectic of opposing forces. Um, I don't think that that's a huge stretch to think about him thinking about it that way. In the 74 book, it's there, right? It's not quite in as bald uh, a Marxist language, um, but the, the roots of it are there. Now, within the laboratory, of course, his graduate students had to give him a hard time about this. So that this is the quotation on the thing. This is their May Day celebration, right, of Professor Lewinton. And so here are the students uh, literally sort of reacting to the intensified contradiction of the laboratory. Another one, you know, having his mind blown while he's reading the, the dialectical biologist. Um, but back to this. So the, what's going on in the dialectical biologist? Basically, in the dialectical biologist, he's coming up with a methodological set of prescriptions that are politically motivated. There's two ways to think about politics and science here, and Lewinton sort of engages with both. 
even in the 1974 book, one of the reasons it seems so political is that he comes off right at the beginning and says, there are two political ideologies regarding change, people that like change and people that don't, right? He's one of the people that likes change. He says, if you like change, you like variability, you like diversity, you're not a racist, right? If you don't like change, you're conservative in the sense that you want things to stay the same. Um, and you might favor sort of a eugenic ideal, right, of the people that are selected by natural selection to be the best. And so he sort of poses all of evolutionary genetics in terms of these ideological conflicts that can't be resolved, right? And so one of the reasons there's so much conflict in evolution is that these deep political ideological commitments that biologists might not even be aware of, okay? On the other hand, there's also this methodological interpretation that comes up more. And so when he's writing about the nature of dialectical biology in 2001, he says, look, let's think about it as uh, a set of warning signs, right? Warning signs for who is sort of one of the interesting questions. He was very reflexive. I think they're warning signs for other people as much as they are for himself. So he says things like, remember to pay attention to real objects and not lose them in utterly idealized abstractions. Remember that qualitative effects of context and interaction may be lost when phenomena are isolated. So let's apply these to linkage, right? Linkage of disequilibrium are utterly idealized abstractions, right? Um, they don't exist. They make all sorts of false assumptions. <laughs> the effects of chromosomal context and gene interaction may be lost when genes are considered in isolation from each other. And then the opposition of multiple forces like linkage, recombination, and selection matter for how we understand genome structure and the hereditary units of selection. So this dialectical framing, this methodological warning signs apply very, very well to these lessons from linkage. I don't think that this is an accident. The dialectical biology reading is retrospective. He articulates these methodological principles after the 1974 sort of disaster. Uh, with linkage, okay? I think that's in part because of the disaster with linkage, right? He did not like talking about this book. Even his students said that this was a terrible book, right? It hurt him <laughs> intellectually that this book didn't go very well. So I think one of the motivations for articulating these kind of methodological stances that are politically motivated is in response to the poor reception of his 1974 book. So one way to read the linkage work in terms of his dialectical biology is that they help inform exactly these kinds of principles, principles that move you away from sort of a reductionistic individualism toward a more communitarian, more interactionist uh, approach to biology in general, right? This is quite a statement coming from really one of the foremost mathematical modelers in evolutionary biology, but that's in part you know, part of his political motivation, which is to eschew that kind of individualism, push toward that more collective uh, cooperativity. So we're still working on this one. Um, this one actually could be a really long haul to, to get the evidence for it because Harvard has impounded most of Lewinton's papers. So uh, maybe the next generation, they come out of uh, <laughs> impounded in 35 years. So um, we'll see if there's evidence. Maybe I'll just post it as a bold hypothesis that, that awaits future uh, mm -hmm. confirmation from the next generation. With that, thank you for your attention. I'd love to have questions. Thank you.